any problems with reading the screen or any questions?
point on here. So the point is, it has some knowledge of stuff over here. Now, you also have your domain classes with their object oriented model. You need to map these two. So, first of all, you need to keep your image. If you're going to pretend that your relational database understands object orientation, but your relational database, of course, in fact, understands persistence and concurrency, it understands committing transactions or rolling them back, then that part of your image that is pretending that the relational database is observant had better also understand that. So, Lorp has a thing called unit of work whose job is to keep the image and the database in sync as regards the transactions. Right? So much for what's on the left of this diagram. Over here, we have our domain classes at the top, we have our tables uh, in, and our columns in the database at the bottom, and we have to model both of them. Glorp has to understand the object-oriented view of the model, so it has to model some instance variables, those you will persist, it has to model some classes, those you will persist, um, and it has to model, of course, the database tables and fields and so on in which the data will be stored, and then its real cleverness is to have a system of descriptors and mapping from joins, which basically allow those two models to map to each other, so you don't have to worry about it. Okay, so, the demo system. It is a whiskey website. I got bored with endless employee databases. I just couldn't face another employee database. So, um, we're going to do a whiskey website, and I promise you, you may not know much about Glorp at the end of this talk, but you will know more about whiskey. <laughs> that's, that's guaranteed. So, there will be some benefit in this, whatever happens. Um, okay, and just to motivate you, I've brought along two whiskeys. A whiskey you are not allowed to drink, you're allowed to gaze in awe on this, which I have got and giving to uh, Dirk, who uh, does this. And I have another whiskey which you are allowed to drink. I'm not going to let you drink it during the talk, because I'm afraid that uh, uh, in the tutorial it might actually uh, hinder you. But I've got this, and I've also brought some lavender shortbread, and in the reception I will be another table, and all the questions that you didn't realise you needed to ask during this talk, you can come up to me, you can ask them, and to motivate you to do that, I have uh, this and some shot glasses, and you can have a dram of whiskey for every question. If you ask too many questions, you may not be able to ask, remember the answer, <laughs> but we'll get that. So, let's actually just look at the domain. First of all, let's look at its front end. So let's just understand it from the point of view of anyone that's actually coming in. So we're, we're, we're selling whiskeys, so if we come to its website, we may be see what can we buy here, what well, we could buy a single malt. So what single malt would we buy? Well, let's make it Talisker. Partly because it's the Isle of Skye malt, and that's where my wife's family comes from, but mainly because you can probably pronounce the word Talisker without too much difficulty. Hopefully this is not too tiny for you to see. Um, but anyway, yes, we seem to have a lot of Talisker in the shop. Let's get a little breath of the Isle, the first one. Okay, so we can see, for example, here, if you can hopefully see that, that is a Bourbon matured um, whiskey. Uh, a Bourbon cask was used to mature it. Some whiskies are finished in other casks to develop a more complex flavor, but this one has not been finished. And um, supposing you were visiting the shop, you might think, well, would I actually be able to, you know, given what monstrous sum they're charging for this, would I actually be able to get a taste of it, first of all, see if I want it? Is there an open bottle? Yes, there would appear to be an open bottle. So we have an open bottle. Buy a brand before deciding whether you wanted to, you know, like taking a car for a test drive. Um, obviously, I could wander around this rather longer, but that's not the point. So let's just close this up now. Um, and, uh, Two monitors problem. Uh, so I had this thing open before I was actually going to 
probably be So far, so good. Let's go back. Okay. okay, so there's a fair amount of Gore documentation around, um, but not as much as there is in the Gore system. Um, there are some docs in your uh, visual works and Logic Studio installations. There's a Gore guide, which is good for getting started. I strongly recommend reading it uh, if you do decide to go ahead. Um, you will probably be seeing a mapping tool, which is one of the supports that the studio offers, and we will look at that too. Roger Whitney's law tutorial is now very old and uses old protocol and misses out some things that were uh, have been added and things more automatic, but still uh, good. If you decide my tutorial wasn't good enough, then you can always go to that one and maybe um, supplement it. And of course, there's the actual tutorial guide, which I hope has now been passed around and everyone has it. And you probably want to find that. It's a PDF uh, document on that stick along with the file ends. And you probably want to have that and have it open because when you're doing the exercises, you're really going to want to consult that. Um, uh, and that is something of a rehash of my talk of last year with additional slides, which I will refer you to when you come to doing the exercises. OK, so, so much for what the application's front end looks like. Um, let's actually have a look at um, what the domain looks like. Okay, this is a bit of the Whiskey domain. We are going to be looking just at the classes in the center. So we're going to start off on the cast class, which is very simple. We will then add in the finish class, which is also pretty simple, but have a relationship to it. We will then look at this hierarchy of products or bottles, which are whiskey, and your uh, file in actually contains blends and batted blends and grain whiskies and single malts, but I don't actually expect us to get that far. Um, and um, this, if you're wondering, is one of the modeling tools of the Office Studio. I shall simply be using this and the mapping tool, which we'll come to in a minute, for two reasons. First of all, it simply gives you a visual indication, and it has some more information about it than is necessarily looking at the code. But also, since the point of the exercise will be to stop and write code, I shall sometimes be mean to you and, and not show you the code that you're trying to write, so you're not just sort of reading the slides and typing it, but are actually forced to try and wander around more find things um, by indicating where we are in these tools. So these tools are, are all kind of front end, really <coughs> allowing you to generate stuff. So again, I'm going to be neat. I'm not going to let you use them. force you to actually work code. So um, that's what it is. Um, so we have that. And also, I will be spending more of my time um, actually in the mapping tool. So for example, here we see we're starting on the cask, and the cask has these various things. Now, again, shout at me if this is completely, if, if you guys can't read, then there are two options. One, move forward, or two, um, shout at me. Um, if you do neither, I will assume that you can read what I'm showing you on the screen. Um, so uh, nobody is actually shouting. Yes, someone is looking a little, maybe, yeah. I encourage people to come nearer. You know, I won't. You know, it's quite safe. It's quite safe. But you, know, so you can expand the size. Trouble is, if I expand the size, I lose screen uh, real estate on the screen. So probably not. Okay. So here, for example, the tool is mapping a cask um, class to the D tuple tube cask table. And here, down here, we can see that this table has. A whole bunch of generic stuff, which I'm not going to flip on you at the moment, and a finish uh, and a type and a size. And we can, if we want, just have a look at the data, but I'll come to that in a minute when we actually get into the exercise. So, um, points to note at times in the exercises, you'll be creating cask instances or finish instances. Keep that code around because periodically we will destroy and recreate our tables. 
to them, and then you'll want to rerun those that code and recreate your instances. Um, and um, I'll be showing you the other uh, scripts that we go through. So at this point, we are ready to move over to the actual domain. You have a domain, and I'll just hide that from you. OK, so we've had a look at some things. We're ready to start our first exercise. So the first exercise is simply to create a class model method for the cast class. Now you should have in your um, in the stuff you've been given, you have the um, you presumably got all that loaded, and if not, then obviously I have to come around. Uh, you should actually find the cast class, and if you examine the cast class, then you can see as we're looking here that it's got a type a size variable. You are going to need to create a class model for it, and for that you need slides, numbers, in order to do the first exercise you're going to need slides, numbers 9, number 11, and number 14 in your uh, PDF, which I trust you have open. So um, we're needing to look at uh, class model. Now if you're looking at slide 9, So I'm talking about this slide and the one before. Okay, so we'll call that up. Slice 8 and slice 9 in your class model. Okay, so do people have any of this verify that everyone's got? Teacher's coming. Teacher's coming, yes. I'm just looking over this game. Okay. The way to deal with this, there are slides with blue titles that are information, just general information. The slides with blue titles that follow the slides with orange titles are information that will help you in the exercise. The slides with orange titles are the slides that are actually telling you how to do things. So the first point to notice about uh, slide eight is this is telling you something about how the law works. And I realize I should probably go into more detail about this. You define the mapping with three things. The class model, which deals with that mapping the domain to the block understanding. And there is the table model, which deals with mapping the table into Glorp. And then there's the descriptor that handles the mapping of the two models to each other. So in order to do this first exercise, in order to do this first exercise of mapping one class to one table, we are going to have to create a class model so that we have the class, a table model so that we describe the table we're going to map to, and a descriptor that's going to map the two. Now you might be asking, why do we have methods like this? Class model for cask would be what we have here. Table model for D242 cask. Descriptor for task. Why do we have these names? When Alan created Glorp, he wanted it to be able to function a lot across a lot of environments. So he wanted to be able to have a method of creating data of specific Glorp models that 
was portable across environment. So he decided to embed the key points, like the domain name and the table name, in method names. So there's a broad descriptor system that goes looking for every method called class model for, table for, descriptor for, extracts the name you put in, creates an instance, and then passes that instance in to be further programmed. So if you look at the next slide, the template class model, that one is showing you how you would set something in. You would have a class model passed in, and given the name that you would put here, and you can then say to it, all right, I want you to have some attributes. Okay, so what I'm doing to you here is I'm challenging you to look at the task class. So let's find it here. I'm saying, okay, you can see it's in some variables. It's got a type and it's got a size. They're both a type string. I'm showing you the template for how you map them, and I say, write the class. And basically, I'm now being, I'm being mean to you now. I'm sort of saying, have an attempt to write the class. Now, anyone who wants can hold up their hands in horror right at the start and say, show me the answer. I can't do this yet. I'm going to be going too fast. Um, but hopefully. I actually wonder how many people have used Blurb before. Has everyone in the room used Blurb? No, most people, I imagine. I hope okay. one or two people have. Most of them have, yeah. Huh? So basically, at this point, I'm saying you've got a descriptor system loaded, which is um, sort of, um, you've got a descriptor system loaded here. Grand 242 descriptor system. This has almost nothing in it. It's got a few things you will use later. It's almost empty. And I'm challenging you to write this method that I'm deliberately not showing you, class model for class.
pair programming. Uh, I'm actually expecting people to pair program. I think it's much better. It's much better if you sit in pair and talk. So I'm all heart really I'm now going to actually put up the um, answer hiding hiding the bit. Okay, so, anyone need more time to have that method fully done in their image? Do, do please, and don't let me go too fast. So, anyone, anyone wanting me to hold off or shall we carry on? Okay, wait one more minute. Um, the first line of that method is self persistent. We're going to see that later. You'll see that later. Okay. I've provided that method for you. Uh, we'll talk about it in the next system. Okay, so you did something very simple and straightforward. You, um, in your descriptor system, you created a, a method class model for the name of the object. That ensured that your vault system, when it tries to fire up, will look for class model for anything, extract the anything, create an instance of class model, put the name cask in its name, and will then assign to it the fact that it's got two instance variables called type and size, and these will be suitable for reading and writing direct scripts. Very simple. So that was the class model. Now, if we look again at our template, we'll see that we've got two more things to do, the table and the descriptor. Now, if we want to look at the table, then 
At this point, I have to ask who has a database ready to use on their system? Right, one person has a database. Anyone else got a database? No, no. You've got a database. Okay. The one I'm dealing with is just a database. You can oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, any, any data, and data. And this is the full database. So this is Postgres, and we're actually looking at the PT admin. So, who, who has either Postgres or Oracle or DB2 or um, you know, anything? Does anyone not have a database? Mark, I know about you already. Does anyone not have some kind of database installation? Sorry, not. Um, oh, you're installing, right. <laughs> Okay, so I'll assume you have a database, and all my instructions will be related to Postgres. Um, at the point where we actually, it makes a difference, I'll try and say it's already going to do that. Does anyone, is anyone who's got a database not using Postgres? So, okay, you are using? DB2. DB2, right, fine. And you are using Oracle, right, okay, fine. So basically, when you see me saying things like Postgres socket platform or Postgres QL platform, you need to look for subclasses of database platform and find the one you want, which will be, um, it's, there's a subclass called Oracle Platform, and so on. So there's just one or two places where you need to do things like that. Um, so I have already created my tables, but obviously you haven't. So I have the table in here, and I can see this table actually exists, and it's got various columns, including um, type column and size column that uh, can be looked at. But in your case, you're actually going to use Glorp to create the tables for you. You're going to tell Glorp what the table looks like, and then you're actually going to say create the table. So I'm just going to put that down for the moment, and bring up the mapping tool. So here is a table that we want to create, and again, you're going to, we're going to destroy and recreate the table a few times, we're going to add more stuff to it. For the moment, we only care about three things. We care about the type and the size, and we care about this thing, the if, which is where we come in at this third method. Okay, you have a method persistent object class model defined in your descriptive system. It already defines that, so you can simply add it. It's probably sensible, however, to have a look at uh, Okay, now, if you look at yours, you'll see that all this stuff is commented at. It is doing nothing except giving you an id. And that is basically, when you put data into a relational database, relational databases have an idea of identity. Object orientation idea of identity, of course, is um, object identity. Relational database idea of identity is certain fields are key fields, and the combination of those um, decides identity. So you're going to have to have, either to use existing fields, or to give yourself a field whose purpose will be to be the relational database's value, the identity. In this example, we're doing the latter, so we're going to have an id there. So you can just put that in and have it, and then we want to look at the table for. So let's look at. Okay, now here, the slide you want is too further on. There is a table template, and that is the method that you're going to want to write in order to create the table for method. So,
in order to avoid confusion, I'm saying give them different names. Call them type cask and size cask. Don't call them type and size. And that way, we just this is just a little trivial way of keeping it somewhat different. And here, I'm making it slightly easier. I am actually showing you the code that you're going to create. Um, these are the typical methods that you would write. And the aim is basically to define, you've got to define this kind of relational table, which I'll show in the mapping tool. Okay, so here's your table. Here is your field mapped from attribute type to type cast. This is what the mapping tool knows about. But basically you want a table for, and we call all the tables again. To keep the names different, we just I'm just putting D242 in front of all of them. So you see this is table for D242 cast, not for uh, cast. Again, I've given you for free the persistent object table definition. We'll look at that in a minute. So basically, I'm saying preferably without copying this, just by looking at the slide template, you're going to have two fields called type cask and size cask. They're going to be mapping strings, obviously. You use the platform because you want this to be cross-platform in terms of cross database. So there's Postgres database, there's Oracle database, there is uh, DB2 database. Each database may have a different way of defining a field that holds a string of a certain size. So you use generic protocol, you send some appropriate method, I give an example here of what an appropriate method might be. Um, you send it to the platform instance, which will be an instance of DB2 platform or Oracle platform or database platform, which you can rely on to be there and then you're just going to create a field of that type. So basically this is map the column name to the type. Again, very simple. Okay, so that is the exercise. Write the table for Why, why do you put this the table name with D242? Simply so that we don't get confused about um, names. I mean, there's no necessity to do it. If you don't want to, feel free not to do okay. so. It's just be aware, you may later on see it. It's just a it's, 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 it's literally me, in this application, choosing to preface all my tables with that initial name. Uh, Otherwise, everything is called cast. Everything is called cast, and so you're mapping the cast to the cast via cast. Oh. And if I talk about it, I could confuse you even worse than I probably am already doing in this you know, over hasty and uh, uh, over demanding. But anyway, that's your next exercise, create, create the table for name. And I shall again just do a tour of the room, and hopefully it's fairly straightforward, and then we'll show the answers to the scripture. And after that, we can actually start creating tables and writing and doing real stuff. Okay, first of all, I'm sharing what you said. First of all, I'm sharing what you said. 
first of all, let me stop being mean and show that. And let me also, without obscuring that, go to database platform class. First of all, we look at subclasses. So these are all platforms that will support. And secondly, when we look at its protocol, so for example, I'm very short of screen estate. <laughs> Leave that down there, and you can see you can see table for these two things. But uh, let's scroll down here. And we have the bar chart, smart cookies, and all this. So there, for example, is the bar chart method that I imagine we're all using for working string, and that is just one of a huge number of methods that are in the appropriate protocols. Um, so basically, here is the types protocol on database platform. And that is where you find all the, um, I'm hiding, that my own, hiding my own slide, but you guys have this slide, and you can see where it's saying platform type, then obviously that's, um, you will get an instance or a subclass of this database platform. That's, that's what will, the, 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 the instance variable platform will be mapped to that, and you, by sending this, you will ensure that or that you can literally read from Oracle, write to Postgres, read from one database, write to another, etc. Et um, and this is where you will find all the types that you could possibly want to use, Boolean, blobs, characters, and so on. Um, obviously, you tend to use some types and it's like a doubles and integers and large charts or the bread and butter <coughs> this kind of thing. But that's where that method is got. Um, Okay, so basically using slides 9, 11, 14, and the blue title slides are random, um, you uh, get um, the uh, table 4 method and the, uh, the cast method. And again, in table 4, you'll notice you have this persistent object table definition. And again, look at its definition. I have a lot there, and if we get far enough, we'll look at adding that in. You will find all yours is commented out, and the only thing it's doing is creating you this field id. And the thing to notice, which is discussed in your blue slides, is this whole platform sequence dprimary key. A couple of things are going on there. First of all, the dprimary key is what I was talking about, identity. Relational databases understand identity by saying, okay, I'm on a relational table, I have many fields, these three fields, a unique combination of those three fields identifies uniquely a row. And you identify that simply by saying to those fields the primary key. <coughs> so um, that's how you set up identity. Here we're starting incredibly simply. We've got exactly one field that exists for the sole purpose of being identity. We, we haven't chosen to use our other data all. So we just got id and its identity. And this sequence is a type that basically says the database will set it. You in Smalltalk will not have to worry about creating that ID number. You will create instances of class. You will not set a value for ID. You will write them to the database. And when you've done that, it will have a value for ID. The database will generate and maintain unique IDs and will provide them to you. And you do that by just an addition, um, ahead, for, for databases that don't have this sequence feature, Glob even implements a small talk site, yes. generation of the ID number and returning that. So yes, that's a very good point. Thanks, thanks for reminding me about that. Um, typically a database will have an optimized and efficient way of doing this, but you can do it all in the small talk site. You can pretend that the database is doing what a database should be able to do, but in fact get it from and that's an in-memory sequence which Claude will maintain. But it has the same desirable property. Will, the numbers will be generated automatically, they get rid Okay, so hopefully you now have the class method and uh, table four method. 
And in both cases, you've added in these calls to persistent object definitions. So now, we go to the third thing, which is to map the two to each other, which is the descriptor. And again, <coughs> the answer away quickly. I basically